Hello and good afternoon to the L to the daily special coverage from L24. Today, we take a look at the main developments as the Russia-Ukraine war enters its 187th day. The hot debate all over Europe now is Zaporizhia nuclear power plants, where concerns about the potential risk of radiation leaks at the plant persists. Ukrainian and Russian authorities issued fresh warnings about the risk of radioactive leaks after shelling that the sides blamed on each other. To this matter, today, Monday, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency said that the UN nuclear watchdog's long-awaited expert mission to the Zaporizhian power in Ukraine is on its way. On the other hand, European Union foreign ministers meeting this week are unlikely to firmly back the visa ban on all Russians, though the EU foreign policy chief Joseph Burrell disagree on that saying, I don't think the idea will have to require this fairness to analyze all this information. I'm joined live by Ukraine, by, uh, from Ukraine by Mr. Oleksiy Kubin, PhD in political science and senior lecturer, alongside Mr. Opamanyu Basso, assistant professor of political science from New Delhi, India. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us in this debate. A short break and we will be back. And before we delve into our discussion, let me read for you this piece of information. Gentlemen, Russia on Sunday again accused Ukraine of shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plants, claiming a pipeline had been damaged in the latest attacks. Defense Ministry spokesperson Igor Koshankov said that Ukraine continued its provocations, suggesting it aimed to create the threat of a man-made nuclear disaster. The Kyiv regime continues its provocations with the aim of creating the threat of a man-made nuclear disaster at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Over the past day, two shellings by artillery units of the armed forces of Ukraine on the territory of the nuclear plant were recorded. A total of nine missiles were fired, three of which fell in the area of Special Corps No. 2, which stores new nuclear fuel of the TVEL company and solid radioactive waste. As a result of the projectiles hitting the territory of the Zaporizhia power plant, a pipeline was damaged by Sharpnell. As a result of the second shelling, one projectile fell in the area of the 6th power unit and the other five in front of the 6th unit pumping station, which provides cooling for this reactor. So, Alexei, I will be starting with you since you are in Ukraine. Uh, in one hand, Ukraine is saying that Russia is still shelling around Slovyansk. And on the other hand, uh, Russians are declaring that Ukrainian troops are still bombing near the, the nuclear facility. So, how can you simply justify these shellings that all the world is warning about? It could cause a disaster. No, uh, Zaporizhia nuclear plant, it's a major nuclear plant uh, in Europe, yeah? And now this plant occupied by the Russian, and that's why the most responsibility uh, about the station, it's a Russian case, because this station now under occupation. From Ukrainian position, Ukraine neutral uh, mission on this uh, plant, because uh, now we've seen that situation in some aspect dangerous because uh, it's uh, some military uh, fears uh, about the station, uh, some uh, shelters uh, on the Energodar, uh, it's a, a city near the nuclear plant. That's why, in my opinion, the most important uh, uh, decision for this situation, it's uh, 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 recontrol it of the station by the Ukraine and uh, maybe some, uh, for the some uh, transitional uh, period some control from the UNO uh, MAGATE uh, and uh, as a uh, mission on this uh, plant. Mm -hmm. 
Very good indeed. Uh, Mr. Basso, how can you explain the continuous shelling over Zaporizhia nuclear power plants? Why neither Russia nor Ukraine is thinking of the world's safety? Europe already witnessed the catastrophic disaster of Chernobyl in 1986. Why they keep escalating the situation over there? Right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, actually, in these kind of situations where like two major powers are involved and because it is already escalating ever since, like it has been like 187 days right now. So the entry of agencies like the IAEA uh, has two repercussions. The first thing is that uh, the visit of a team from the IAEA uh, somewhat rationalizes and also normalizes the takeover of Russia Russia of this new major nuclear plant as mentioned by uh, the former colleague as well. So here the question that at the major question lies that why the why has been answered for a very long time is that uh, there are political historical reasons as to why Russia is escalating this war and uh, you see that even country uh, the entire economic Union like European Union and the entire world taking a stance against Russia, the answer is very clear that the escalations are there, but still these two countries have had one is fighting for their survival and the other country is fighting just for its own uh, cultural and political image. So the answer lies there that the rationalization and the justifications are different. Uh, but the war continues and especially the entry of these agencies of UNO and also the IAEA somewhat rationalizes the takeover of these nuclear plants of some ways because the visit somewhat gives also a message that uh, it has justified of sorts that Russia has taken over this nuclear plant and if there are physical damages or if there are no physical damages whatever the uh, reports say after this uh, then it is a form of normalization according to me at least. Mm -hmm. Uh, quite understood. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Uh, Alexei, you said that Russians are responsible and Russia also has been called by more than 42 countries to withdraw its troops from the nuclear plant. So how can you explain these calls, though one of the main reasons why Russia launched this military operation for the first place is to put hand on these nuclear plants? I mean, why they can't call on the Ukrainian authorities to stop their shelling over there and try a peaceful talk? But, you know, Ukraine now uh, want uh, for some peaceful talk and want some uh, format uh, for the uh, control it about the station. But it's uh, uh, some situation from the Russian side, because, yes, I, I agree with you that it makes sense that uh, Russia won't control this uh, nuclear plant because it's uh, some strategic object in the eastern part, in the southern part of Ukraine. It's, it's very important for the, for, from the Russian position for the some occupied regions. Yeah, for example, Kherson Oblast or part of the Zaporizhia Oblast, maybe for the Crimea. It's, a, uh, you know, uh, fr from the uh, all Ukrainian energy potential, uh, Zaporizhia uh, nuclear plant, it's a 25% from all energy uh, 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 and it, it, it's a huge, yeah, hu huge um, for Ukraine and huge uh, maybe from Russia. It's a, uh, the real price of this uh, nuclear plant. It's a billion and billion dollars. Yeah, it's a it, it's a very important strategic object. And yes, I agree that uh, from Russia position, Russia won't control it uh, this uh, nuclear plant, but. Uh, in this situation now, uh, maybe the most uh, con uh, controversial way, it's a, some natural control by the international organization, maybe for the first uh, time, yeah? Uh, be, uh, uh, with the parallel uh, peaceful talking about the uh, situation on, on the station. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Now moving on to tackle the second point. Uh, UN nuclear watchdog will inspect the Russian held Zabarusia nuclear power plants in Ukraine this week. Instead, on Twitter on Monday, that the announcement comes after a month of negotiations in which the International Atomic Energy Agency sought to gain access to the facility, which Ukrainian staff are operating under the orders of Russian forces. A situation that IAEA has said that threatens the safety of Europe's largest nuclear plant.
Coming to you, Mr. Basso, what is your interpretation to this visit and what is the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency toward the nuclear crisis? Right. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier that the entry of these agencies has two aspects. The first thing is obviously uh, to assess physical damage, evaluation of the conditions in the because there are Ukrainian staffs who are still working at that plant and also to determine whether the functionality and uh, the various security systems are at place or not. But the other angle to this, uh, the entry of United Nations agencies uh, in this, uh, this trip of sorts uh, within Ukraine uh, and uh, to assess this condition is that they are forming a sort of legitimacy and rationalization of Russian takeover of the largest of one of the largest nuclear uh, power plants uh, in Ukraine, uh, erstwhile Ukraine of sorts. So uh, it is very important to understand that uh, right now, as mentioned earlier as well, right now uh, strategies of making sure the, the whether it can be taken over by Ukrainian forces, whether that is an option or it, is the union uh, UN agencies coming into play and actually helping Russia of sorts uh, by, by subconsciously or not, that is their purview. But I think that from our end, uh, this is a very, uh, it is a positive stance from IEA's perspective at least. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Alexei, what is your expectation from this visit? Do you think that this delegation would manage to find a peaceful solution? And now, how could Zelensky make promises to bring back Crimea last week while he is still fighting over the eastern part of the country? You know, uh, about this uh, trip, yeah, of the international atomic energy. Um, from my position, uh, we need not a single trip. A single trip is important, maybe, yeah, for the some evaluating about the physical dimension, uh, phys some physical situation, and so on. But we need a mission, mission on this station by the United Nations organization. Uh, it, it, it's very important because uh, some uh, only single trip, it's not a solution yeah, from the International Atomic Energy a, a, a Agency. Uh, solution, it's a, for, the, for the first uh, time, it's a, some uh, mission on the station with the uh, uh, and parallel, yeah, this talking about uh, Ukraine, Russia, UNO, uh, about the situation uh, on the station uh, and about the uh, needed uh, join the state, uh, this uh, nuclear plan to the Ukrainian energy system. Because from Russian position now, they want to uh, destroy this joining, yeah, uh, 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 the Puriska nuclear plant to the Union Ukrainian energy system and want to uh, cr uh, create uh, this uh, nuclear plant to the Russian uh, energy system. Uh, but now uh, maybe the most important uh, question, uh, it's a question about the future uh, uh, battles on the uh, south of Ukraine. Because, it, it, because you know, uh, maybe now it's a, some control attack. Now, it, it, today, Ukraine uh, start a control attack on the Kherson region. Maybe it's influence on, on this situation about the uh, nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. Quite understood. Mr. Basso, previously Russian uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that we will move to a different target after taking control of the Donbass region. Now, don't you think they will use the, a bomb, the explosion last week, uh, as a step forward to relaunch their military operation all over Ukraine? Especially that uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a decree last week increasing his country's armed forces by uh, 137,000. Right. Um, this particular decree uh, is interesting, but uh, there are reports right now coming in as well, uh, challenging the legitimacy of and the rationality of this particular decree. Uh, it has been because it is not just a conventional war right now. It is also a psychological war. So these statements, uh, according to me, uh, is more about a psychological threat that is being openly shared in the media and uh, it is being discussed of sorts mostly helping russia of sorts that 
uh, you create this psychological Hobbesian structure that uh, they are the all powerful and they are also increasing the armed forces. But uh, if you want to question the rationality behind it, whether it is possible, do they have the numbers, uh, then you actually create that whether this is a bubble that is about to burst or whether there is considerable form of data behind it. So I think these statements are more to create a psychological warfare of sorts and to uh, increase their presence and the kind of uh, war they are fighting even within EU with the gas lines and the Nord Stream 20% capacity and all these economic actions that they are, they are taking from their end. So these all these as a cumulative, it becomes like a psychological warfare, a stalemate kind of situation from both ends. Mm -hmm. Very good. Say, uh, derived from your words saying that it is a psychological war, uh, Mr. Oleksiy, I have al already mentioned that um, Mr. Vladimir uh, Volodymyr Zelensky said that we are taking back Crimea. So do you think this is part of the media war and the psychological war? Because taken into consideration now, his country is almost had been taken by the Russians. So why he could uh, make a new promises? You know, uh, in my opinion, it's important for the Ukrainian president uh, talking about the Crimea because it's a some uh, maybe symbol, yeah. Uh, because Ukraine uh, in, uh, in, in near days uh, we uh, have uh, Independence Day and some discussion about the future of Crimea. It's important because it's a, some part of the Crimea platform created by the Vladimir Zelensky. And maybe in this context, uh, we hear about the uh, Crimea in some speeches uh, of the president. That because for the Zelensky, um, important, very important, that uh, Ukraine demonstrate that uh, Kiev did not uh, forgotten yeah, about the Crimea. Uh, and it's one of the most important priorities for the um, uh, Ukraine. But from another aspect, yeah, maybe it's a, some uh, psychological, yeah, influence uh, and influence not only the Ukrainian, but also for the Russia, because uh, now the main uh, war uh, line, it's a uh, uh, southern part uh, of Ukraine and eastern part uh, of Ukraine. But it's a some maybe sign that uh, next step, it's a, uh, some situation with the Crimea. And for the Russia, uh, maybe it's very, very important because uh, from the Russian position, uh, Crimea, it's, a, uh, it's not a question uh, for the negotiate, but Ukraine now wants uh, to create a situation about the Crimea uh, as a uh, question point. Mm -hmm. Quite understood. Now, let's tackle another point. The UK is flying underwater drones to Ukraine and training Ukrainian personnel in Britain to use them to clear its coastline. Six autonomous mine hunting vehicles will be sent to the country to help detect Russian mines in the waters of East Coast. How this act is helping the, is helping the Ukraine to face the Russian? Don't you think Ukraine now, and as Zelensky stated, is looking only for victory? So they need a real help, not a symbolic trainings. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, in my opinion, um, uh, it's important because now Ukrainians uh, want uh, to um, um, stress, uh, first of all, on the situation of the southern part of Ukraine and also its uh, Black Sea region. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're talking about the Crimea, Kherson region, region. It's a Black Sea region, and Ukraine now won't demonstrate that uh, with the Western support, Ukraine uh, have some uh, opportunities uh, to uh, maybe attack uh, on the. Uh, Russian Navy uh, and uh, on the uh, Russian military position on the Black Sea region. Because for Ukraine, it's very important because now we have a semi-blocked uh, some uh, Black Sea ports. And it's very important question about the uh, deblocade uh, 
to to total the blockade these ports uh, for the export and import uh, and because it's very important for the Ukrainian economy. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Basso, do, do, do you think this kind of training and such six water drones deliveries will assist Ukraine to secure the Black Sea as they claimed? Um, I think, like according to me, there will be a mismatch of sorts, as you said, that these are uh, still right now. I would say that these are symbolic gestures, and uh, as Zelensky has also mentioned, that right now, what you need to counter Russia, you would need excessive force, not just these training, and also. What is the time frame that these people are saying? Uh, how long these training sessions will happen, and the kind of time whether they will be accustomed of to of usage of these advanced uh, uh, machinery? So that also becomes a question, right? That like the absorption part first is the training, and then the absorption part whether it will be equivalent or not. So just sheer numbers, it won't be equivalent of sorts. Uh, but obviously, there has to be a positive. I understand the context set here that it has to be a positive angle as well, because it right now it's just not with the question of war and peace here. It is also a question of um, fighting against an aggressor state like Russia. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand the numbers as well. Based on this, uh, just staying with you, Mr. Basso, I have already mentioned this, but last week, the daughter of uh, Putin's ally, Alexander Dogan, killed by car bomb in Moscow. Will this kind of operations in the Russian lands, such as this explosive device in the cars, will bring fear to the enemy lines or only will make them consistent to finish the operations in Ukraine? Right. These uh, domestic factors will obviously have a huge understanding. Like it will have severe repercussions right now as well, because uh, you are in a condition where uh, both, both the forces are trying their hell bent to try to neutralize each other. So if these are like politically as well, if the conditions are of such where you literally see this kind of destruction, then it will have severe repercussions in the in the border lines as well. Maybe more aggressions, more escalations and more zeal to fight and take over. What you can actually see right now also with the nuclear power plants takeover and the kind of messaging that it is going on in the media as well. So yeah, there is a direct correlation. Nobody can deny that. Mm -hmm. Tackling another point, uh, European Union Defense and Foreign Ministers meeting in Prague this week will discuss operation and rather options for setting up an EU military training missions for Ukrainian forces and will also consider calls of some members to ban Russian tourists from entering the bloc. Sir Alexei, the Czechs, who currently hold the EU's rotating presidency, are pushing for an EU-wide ban on visas for Russian tourists. As an idea, and uh, an idea supported mainly by the Baltic countries, what's your saying on this, and why Russian citizens pay the debt of their government? You know, uh, from the Russia, uh, from the Ukrainian position, uh, it's uh, some um, justice uh, step, because uh, in some aspect, Russian citizens they are also responsible for some actions of their government. But but uh, from another case, uh, in this situation, it's not about the total ban for the Russian, yeah, but about the uh, tourist ban tourist visa to the European Union, because from Russians uh, who, uh, for example, from the opposition groups, uh, Russians who did not uh, support aggression Russian uh, against Ukraine, they, uh, uh, in future, they uh, uh, save their uh, uh, the opportunities uh, to uh, travel uh, to the European Union. Yeah, but from the some Russian in the tourist way, maybe uh, it's it makes sense. Yeah, because uh, in my in my opinion, uh, it's a situation uh, about the some um, good uh, some um, real. Uh, Stress real steps. So, uh, Alexei, the, let me yeah. add this for you. Why precisely, precisely the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, precisely are strongly pushing for this decision? Why the countries that share border with Russia are strongly uh, accepting this decision? 
because you know these countries has uh, common borders uh, with the Russia, and these countries fear that uh, situation with Ukraine is their future. This country uh, has uh, some fears about the future steps by the Russia. If Russia uh, thinking that uh, aggression uh, against the independent countries, it's a normal. Mm -hmm. Mr. Basu, coming to you, uh, let's keep uh, NATO keep always calling for more spending on its defense capabilities. But on the other hand, they can't guarantee the safety of its allies such as Ukraine, though it's not a member in this alliance, but reports said that NATO could have done more to prevent Russia from invading Kiev. What are you saying on this? Right, as you said, like the answer lies there that just because officially you cannot really say that uh, Ukraine was part of NATO, that uh, the kind of behavior that NATO would have with its member states was different as far as Ukraine was concerned. And the entire fiasco was based on that per se and uh, UK, Ukraine uh, trying to come inside NATO and it actually aggravated the situation with Russia as well. And this was a similar history that we see with uh, the taking up of uh, Crimea, Crimea as well. So here uh, the question lies is that mostly uh, these all these uh, organizations or be it uh, or like understandings and treaty organizations like NATO, it works under the premise that uh, they will be able to support other member states. But over time we have realized that under lot of conditions um, they have failed to do that and it has it's a clear message of sorts but uh, the question is that uh, what are what are the solutions here the first thing is that uh, economic sanctions becomes a solution whether military escalation from other allies will be a solution at this stage or you make the situation more aggravated so there are like two situations here right now we are following a different pattern of economic sanctions of such where you see you member states uh, also divided as such like even uh, this tackling this question about visa ban you see these countries most of the EU, EU, eu is getting divided some people are supporting it some people are not based on their own equations and their uh, histories so here also the NATO also breaks it at these situations because Russia is an aggressor and a huge aggressor state. It's not just a little state trying to act smart. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Mr. Renex, it's more than six months now within this military operation in Ukraine. So what is your interpretation for the coming months? I mean, uh, will the situation get better or only is going to get worse? Uh, you know, in, in, in my opinion, now uh, maybe uh, the main tendency is uh, continuous of, of this uh, war. Yeah, and it's very for Ukraine, it's very dangerous uh, because now we uh, seen in, uh, in some aspect of war about the resources, uh, not only the uh, actual yeah uh, military uh, forces, but about the resources. It's a some race. And is this race a very um, hard for Ukraine? Because now Ukraine need much more Western help in different kinds. It's a, a financial help, a financial aid. It's a military aid. Because Russia in this situation has, uh, in, in my opinion, has strategy about the uh, long term. Russia... Uh, uh, in, in some aspect, uh, want uh, to uh, wait in, but for Ukraine, time it's very important. Mm -hmm. Quite understood. To this end, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, a special thanks to our panel of guests, Mr. Basu from India, Mr. Alexei from Ukraine, for your thorough analysis. Thank you so much. And for now, all I can say: take care of yourself and have a blessed day.